Hi, I'm Thomas Bowles, Prince William County Agricultural Extension Agent. Welcome to our video. Good morning, everyone. My name is Thomas Bowles. I'm the Ag Agent here in Prince William County. Uh, welcome to this Wednesday's class. Today's class is on shade plants. Harriet Carter is going to be presenting. Hi, everyone, and good morning. I will talk about um, I will talk about plants that I know a little bit about. I and let me tell you about me just a, a tad. I am a master gardener since 2014 and uh, started becoming involved in a shaded area in our VCE master uh, master gardener teaching garden. So because of this, uh, I, fell, uh, I fell in love with uh, shade plants. And you may be coming to this program thinking, well, I need to know more, but some people I talk to that have a vision about shade plants being monotonous, being boring, not having any color at all, and that is so far from the truth. We will dispel this myth. You will learn. There is no way on earth I can talk about uh, all the shade plants that are available for our area. But I will talk about some that I'm familiar with and that I work with on more or less a daily basis or that I know uh, that I uh, at least know a little bit about, OK? So um, shaded areas, not all shade is equal. There is dry shade, there is shade with some moisture, there is shade with some filtered light, there is shade that is a very deep shade. So you can have all kinds of conditions. And the thing is, when you start thinking about your area or wanting to plant in shade, you need to think about all of this need to think about soil conditions as well. When you are in an area that I'm familiar with, which is dry, fairly deep shade, that could strike fear in everyone's heart, but it shouldn't. There is a way to overcome that. So we'll talk a little bit about, <clears throat> and um, uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, buildings and fences and walls where you uh, can also plant shade plants and make it look rather pretty. The plants we will be talking about other than trees and shrubs are all perennials, okay? So this is an example of shade, a shade plant, a shade plant planted area that is on a uh, west facing wall. It's quite attractive. And you can see a lot of different plants that you may or may not be familiar with. We have Eucharist here. We have lots of hostas. Everyone knows, host knows about hostas. And we also have some ferns mixed in and some shade loving shrubs. So this looks quite nice. Here's another area that is in much deeper shade than the, the place we just saw. This one here is in deep shade in a wooded area along a um, wire fence. And what the homeowner did here is trying to cover up what they considered was a little bit of a little bit ugly with with the wire. Same for chain link fences if you have it. So they have planted hoster and some shade, some ground cover that thrives in shade. They have also added some, some vines that do well in shade. This is a climbing hydrangea. There are all kinds of hydrangeas, by the way, that, as you know, are shade-loving plants, but there are also climbing hydrangeas. Here's another area that is in shade under trees. This is under mature trees, believe it or not. But they do get some filtered light and you can make it very, very attractive as you can see here. There are some grasses and uh, I have to add to this, I really like it because um, they, have, um, they have some shrubs here 
that's that's the Carolina uh, a spice bush right here, and uh, they have some grasses here. They have some iris here and hostas, and you can see all the colors are different. So when you think shade, think different colors of the foliage, not necessarily the bloom, because what happens to the blooms is eventually they will fade. Uh, blooming seasons um, are very different from plant to plant. Some are very short bloomer, but then the foliage will stay on. And you should plant with foliage in mind that you have for a number of seasons, preferably at least three seasons. So here's another area that was, uh, uh, that was an eastern facing wall. The, the entrance to the house is behind here. And this is a driveway and it was rather bare. So the homeowner in this case planted all these lovely shrubs and some evergreen here and made it quite attractive. Now what they've done here, they have added some annuals along the bottom of the shade plants to give it some color. And, and you can do that too, okay? So, Primarily, I'll be talking about a few understory trees, trees that are at the edge of woodlands or um, houses. I'll talk about shrubs that can stand shade, and I talk perennials and quite a number of ground covers. And if someone tries to tell you that you can't grow anything under the tree, it's not true. You can. All right, um, going back to what I said earlier, my experience, my first experience with shade was in the uh, VCE, uh, the extension in Prince William County's teaching garden. And this is our typical walk up here and the garden starts here, giving a little plug to our beautiful garden, which you can visit. Um, every day, but we prefer you visit us when master gardeners are around. So most of these garden beds are in pretty much full sun or some light shade. The area I will be talking about where I will show you some plants is very much further back here. And that's, that's called woodland or woodland garden. And, um, it took me a while to find out that the most beautiful time, uh, almost a year, because I started working in this garden in, in summer when there were mostly shrubs, um, ground covers, and a couple of um, blooming plants, but not too many. The next spring, however, I discovered it is just absolutely beautiful because what happens is the mature trees here, we have some bass trees, we have, we have oaks, we have, uh, we have some cedars, um, hadn't leafed out. So when I came in spring, it, this, the trees were more or less bare, but the, um, the understory tree as this, uh, such as this Eastern red bud here, had uh, not leafed out yet, but was in full bloom on those wonderful purple blooms are called cauliflower when you see them first. It's an ideal understory tree because you get the color and those beautiful blooms and eventually you get the leaves. And underneath all of that, uh, the early risers will come up, the early spring blooms. And you can see here, all the yellow you see here are the wood poppies. Uh, one of my favorite foliage, as a matter of fact. The blooms are fine. Uh, they're yellow. They look like uh, big, large buttercups. But uh, the nice thing about them, they uh, once you have them established in a setting like this, they will multiply. And you do have to keep them in check. But how nice is this? There are some other bloomers here we can barely see while we'll pay a little bit attention to it. Above here, you can see a little bit of leaves. And what these are, these are leaves of an understory tree, a dogwood, but not our 
um, native dogwood. This is a pagoda dogwood or conus altifolia. And uh, it, it uh, leaves out first uh, fairly large leaves and then it sets up the bloom and it's just gorgeous. And the branches are spread out like a pagoda, like a pagoda style building. So um, ergo, uh, pagoda tree, beloved. And here you can see a close up of this um, uh, little bloom. And, and these get actually fairly large. They look really beautiful. Now the uh, the bloom time of these is about two weeks after that it just converts to foliage, which is very nice. But again, like many trees, it's a short blooming time. But that's a pretty tree. Now the one you are probably more familiar with, maybe this Cornus Florida, our native dogwood. This I just took that picture a few days ago and so uh, the leaves are out and the dogwood is in uh, is in full it's still in full bloom this is not in woodlands this is right close to it though but it is in a somewhat shady area and it's bordered by large shade trees so that our native dogwood is a wonderful understory tree if you like dogwoods to plant in your yard or in your uh, on your property, um, try not to plant it as a tree in bright sun. It does not like it. And uh, over time, uh, it will become weak. It likes a little bit of shade, okay? Another one of my favorites is one we have in Woodlands, Woodlands and it's more like a shrub, but it has tree-like behavior. So I call it a tree and it is called a smoke tree. And it gets these really wonderful uh, dark uh, brown, red mahogany colored leaves. And when it, when it blooms, which it hasn't yet, it blooms later, it will take a while. Uh, early summer, the bloom, the blooms look like as you approach the tree, like light smoke, and that's why it's called smoke tree. Um, it's pretty hardy. Um, you, do need, you do need to make sure it gets some light. Okay. But it's, it's pretty. I like it. The other one, understory tree is a magnificent one it's our witch hazel it's native to this one this particular one is native to our area native to virginia and uh it blooms very late in the year from october through december so when everything else has has passed on as far as blooms go witch hazel our witch hazel starts blooming and it looks quite nice they don't get very, very tall. Um, sometimes they have, uh, there is a property of the witch hazel to have some galls on the leaf. I don't, I don't have a picture here. These are little uh, protrusion on the leaves and uh, don't worry about it when, when you see that it may affect one branch, but it does not affect the health of the tree. So that's our witch hazel. It's a nice understory tree. Okay, and if you have any questions about that, uh, just write them in the uh, chat box and I'll, I'll address them afterwards. Now let's talk about shrubs. Okay, I cheated a little bit here because this is not our woodland. This is the woodland area of, of a friend who has this wonderful shrub called a pinkster azalea, which is uh, actually a rhododendron, but it's native to our area and it's just wonderful. And I snapped the picture a couple of weeks ago, just to, to include that, to make you aware of this wonderful bloom. And you can probably get, get specimens of these, if not from the garden centers, maybe from places that sell natives, okay. 
So one of one of my favorites. I mean, who would not love this? Look at that. Another one, very hardy kind of a shrub. It's a sweet box. Uh, it looks like a boxwood, but it can grow in shade. And if you give it, if it has a little bit of light, uh, it will multiply. It's a very slow grower, though, just like our dog, uh, boxwood too. But it has a, a very light little bloom uh, in in early summer, and it it smells very. It has a beautiful scent. So that sweet box sacococca. That's a shade boxwood. All the other boxwood we know really need sun. Here's another good one, uh, the red twig dogwood, Cornus sericea. I like it because, um, not so much because of the foliage and a very short living bloom, but of the red twigs in winter when everything looks kind of bare and brown and gray. You have you have the red twigs to look forward to. So red twig dogwood is a nice shade loving, and uh, uh, it it does even better if it's not directly in in deep shade, but outside off. So think about that as you're designing and planting your shade garden. Okay, this is Pyrus japonica. It's not a native, but it's a pretty, pretty one. Widely available, uh, thrives in shade. If it gets a little bit sun, you get different color, uh, different colored bloom. It's a, um, it attracts the pollinators like crazy. The bees, uh, everyone, uh, they all like it. So we have a Pyrus japonica uh, in woodland and which blooms in these colors. And it gets some, some attractive foliage later, later in, in the year as it will turn color. So think about that too. Oops, I went a little fast. The witch elder or uh, Father Giller is another really beautiful shrub. It's a native and uh, uh, it is blooming right now or it's just going a little bit past the blooms. And uh, it likes it in shade and uh, it doesn't mind if it gets some more light, but it likes it in shade. And aside from these little uh, blooms here, which are which are rather pretty. It has a gorgeous color in autumn, and uh, I wanted to show you this. Um, and uh, the leaves here, come autumn, the leaves will change from a bright will will be bright yellow to medium yellow orange to a deep red all in one little shrub. So that's a nice one to add. Okay, now let's approach the subject of hydrangea. This is in my own garden here. This is at, this is at Carter's. And we have this one, which is a very old fashioned hydrangea. It's called Endless Summer. You're probably familiar with it. It blooms, uh, it has different colored blooms on one shrub from from light green to pink to to uh, pale um, pale blue to a darker blue all in one and uh, uh, I like it uh, it doesn't like too much sun or if the sun hits it for more than a couple of hours and I have to tell you where it is located here is right on the fence which across from here, the neighbor has three trees, so it is in shade. It's an ideal, it's an ideal location. And uh, what I have done here, uh, I have added later on some, some hostas here too, because they like it too. And uh, a little bit more about hydrangeas. Hydrangeas do like moisture, and um, you're probably familiar with when it uh, blooming season is still far off 
uh, at least another month or so, month and a half. But <clears throat> if you have them in an area where it's very, very dry, you need to modify that. You may have to water them. This one, this my area here, is fed by water from from uh, from the roof, and and I have an underground pipe running to to that spot, so that that really helps that. And if you have if you have hydrangea questions, since I've lived with hydrangeas for a long time, I may probably be able to answer them all. This is our not really, truthfully, not really quite native, but close to. Um, it's uh, native to the southeastern uh, United States here, and it's a lovely plant. It's also a very old-fashioned plant. And unlike the other hydrangeas, which you may have to prune, uh, this one you really shouldn't. Um, and that one thrives in fairly dark shade. That's in very dark shade. This is bordered by, uh, mine here is bordered by uh, uh, by trees and some really big, big ones. So, and it does, it does quite well. All right, so these were some other shrubs. And again, there are a lot more shrubs, but I have limited time. So let's go on to the flowers and to the ground covers. Okay, if that's not everyone's uh, favorite, I don't know what is. Um, this is our uh, this is our hellebore. A lot of people are or Lenten rose. A lot of people are familiar with. Now these guys <clears throat> are the very first ones to bloom. Heck, they bloom. Uh, you can see the blooms when there's still snow on the ground. They try to peek out. And uh, it's a it's a very very early bloomer and once established, um, and it's, an, it's not a native plant, but once established, uh, it will spread and uh, it can act, the foliage can act as, as a ground cover. The blooms um, stick around for at least three months, so you have a long time. Uh, uh, the beauty of, of the blossoms before they set seed and the outer leaves fall off. Is another one. They come in all colors. Um, this this Oriental variety, from white to white white green to light pink to pink mixed with with darker pink or um, a maroon color, a dark magenta. I mean, you name it. There's a lot out there. This one is in uh, this one is in woodlands. It's it's probably my favorite because because of the shading here, and you can see this is this is our mulch in woodlands. These are uh, these are the dried leaves from from previous years, and that's that's my mulch, and we leave it, and over time it will disintegrate and become part of the soil and the soil underneath here, if you put your hand in it, is just wonderful. We, because Woodlands is a natural garden, a natural area, we don't mulch there, we just use leaves. Here's another one, I talked about the uh, uh, darker pinks, that's one of the ones. And you can have them all together in one area. This one is what we now consider a more or less native hellebore. So some um, some people may debate that, but this has been here for hundreds of years now. It's become naturalized as our hellebore fatidas, and uh, while the blossoms look similar to the Oriental hellebore. The foliage is quite different. They are like they are like spikes. Uh, in my book, it's very very attractive, and they actually multiply a lot faster than than the than the Oriental one. That's the color they have. It is that green color, but very very pretty. And again, um, shade. They do fine in shade. Okay. I said the um, 
uh, the hellebore were the very early ones. The first ones coming up then, uh, the ones that will eventually die back or the ephemeral ones, and that's our little uh, galanthus or snowdrops. And they look great in swathes or patches when, when you plant them. Uh, it's just delightful. And they're, they're around for about three weeks. And uh, um, they come in little pops. They are not native, but who wouldn't love them? And when nothing else is out, it looks pretty bare here. You will see them. So that's a nice plant to have. Another woodland plant that is fairly early, not quite as early as the, uh, and, it, and that stays around, it does not die back, is the cream colored violet. And it's a, it's a native and it's, it loves uh, wooded areas or shaded areas. You can plant them in groups if you have a shade area along borders uh, at your house too. Okay, just um, just a little picture of what woodlands looks like in filtered light early. The early bloomers are coming out. Um, it's still very kind of sparse, but but they're starting to. And a little bit later, uh, wood poppies come out and they spread once they are established. They have delightful yellow blooms that they bloom for several weeks the foliage will stay around if you don't want a lot of them take off the seed heads just take them off right here because otherwise um, you will have lots of babies of those but they are pretty and the nice part about wood poppies is that the foliage is wonderful and will be around for three seasons. So that's, it, it's also a nice, uh, nice ground cover. This is what it looks like when it had, had, had a chance to multiply. This is in woodlands. Can you believe it from the earlier picture? This is what it looks like now. So these are the wood poppies and you can mix them with um, other woodland flowers like woodland flocks with bleeding heart and of course with our Virginia bluebell and here we go um, I don't know what I need to say about uh, Virginia bluebell it seems to me we're living right in the midst of an area where uh, where we are famous because of our bluebells there are a lot of parks and trails and woodland areas that are available to us here to view them. They are ephemeral though, so um, they are beautiful, but beautiful only for, in my, in my mind, a very short period of time. And um, they like it moist. So if, if you have a very, very dry area, you can see in this picture, this is in Woodland, we have, a, we have an irrigation system here. It's, um, it's a drip irrigation and the water is fed from, from uh, rain barrels or in other times we just use the hose to the watering hose. So if you don't have enough moisture, they do like it moist. If you're wondering why they're not doing well, they like it moist. And uh, Virginia bluebells uh, come in different colors. They come in white and in pink and in all shades of blue. Mother, Mother Nature is very, very good about designing these. Love them. And these are mature leaves here. And uh, when these all fade, when, when the um, plants, the blooms fade, the leaves stay, stay around for a while, but they start shrinking and they start shriveling up. That's normal. And then they go away. Don't do anything. Don't... Uh, don't take them out. They will disappear from uh, by themselves, okay? All right, that also is woodlands now with bluebells. It's a part of woodlands. It had that wonderful spread. So, but like I said, uh, maybe 
maybe uh, two weeks and then the beauty was was gone we have you can see a few wood poppies here another blue bloomer is jacob's ladder it's uh, it's a very pretty plant it has little bell-like flowers and it's a native um here's a little close-up of this and this is in in a shaded area. That's actually at at my house. I have a have a shaded area along the uh, along the side of the house. And the reason for Jacob's ladder is the um, the uh, leaves are um, in are shaped like little steps steps of a ladder so i guess that's where the name jacob's ladder comes from and they have like like sprigs like a ladder you can climb on at least that's what i tell myself probably the name come from came from here's another um very nice plant uh this is pulmonaria or lungwort uh, it's not a native it has pretty flower comes in different colors and leaves are the foliage is different too at times you can get this variety this is uh, this is the spotted uh, leaf pulmonaria and then there are others that are just plain green but it is a shade plant and it's it has bloomed it's bloomed out that's also a fairly early bloom the uh, leaves stay around they don't die they do not die back at least not as quickly as the bluebells and the snowdrops and all of those here's another native it's our native geranium and by the way this was the um, uh, virginia plant society's named wildflower of the year last year it's our geranium maculatum it's kind of a dainty flower Leaves are very, very pretty. Uh, you can see that's what it looks like in our woodland uh, area. That's what they look like. And um, so they grow fine uh, where it's quite shady. They, uh, they prefer if they get a little bit more light, but they not necessarily need to have it. Okay. So that's a nice plant. Another very early one and now bloomer is our uh, dwarf crested iris or iris cristata. It's very, very short and some people use that more or less as, as, as a ground cover or to cover uh, shaded areas. And it's a, it's a very pretty, it's a very pretty bloom. It doesn't get very, doesn't get very tall, um, uh, not even a foot, so. It is um, a plant, the May apple plant, or the umbrella plant that loves shade. And uh, uh, it, uh, it blooms right now. And the bloom is hidden underneath the plant's umbrella right here. That's the bloom. And uh, you could use it for a while as a as a ground cover but that one one will not last as a ground cover but once uh, it will not be as hardy as some of the ground cover i will show you okay blooms it blooms the same time as the virginia bluebell a little a little bit later and in order to find the blooms you have to lift up the plant but it's very very handsome and uh, the reason it's called May apple because that that forms into a, a bit of a fruit like an apple and uh, a wildlife likes it. Uh, turtles love them, and uh, it's it's spread through uh, through wildlife eating eating the um, uh, eating the little uh, apples the the fruit. Okay. All right, now we've talked earlier a little bit about the phlox. Here's what it looks like. Uh, it can can work in deep shade, light shade, and it can work in sun. That's an all-around good plant to have, but definitely for, for shade. It's called woodland phlox. Uh, it's native uh, phlox uh, divericata. And uh, uh, it, uh, the 
the color is from a varies from a from a blue to a uh, deep lilac color. This is at this is in my garden uh, under a tree that has not yet leafed out and it's surrounded by uh, mature trees. But you can see um, I originally started <clears throat> with two plants, uh, two small plants three years ago. So I've given quite a bit away. So it will spread, but it's lovely. Love it. And <clears throat> you can have it, you can pair it with, um, I have some other plants around here. I have hellebora. I have woodland phlox. And woodland phlox is over here. Woodland phlox had a little bit of a hard time keeping up with, uh, woodland poppy had a little bit of a hard time keeping up with uh, phlox divericata. But <clears throat> they live cordially together. Another fairly deep shade plant is what's called what is called a uh, leopard plant or ligularia. It's a summer bloomer. <clears throat> it's it's a summer bloomer, and um, the leaves are up now. And then once the leaves are uh, once the leaves are esta uh, established, all of a sudden the <clears throat> shoots will come up for for the actual flowers. So the flowers look like this, and it is uh, a nice spot to have. Um, this is what I've managed to grow in, in woodlands. I have some at home too. I have seen ligularia in shaded area at friends' houses where they have huge areas. So uh, I guess it depends, uh, but it likes it well enough. So that's why, why I showed. Try it out. We sold them at the plant sale, by the way, and I think we still have some. Giving a little plug here. Okay, <clears throat> this is a, for some reason, much maligned uh, plant that will, that likes shade. It can um, grow up in shade and provide all kinds of colors. And it's our spiderwort or Tradescancia virginiana. Now, <clears throat> the reason it has sort of a little bit of a bad reputation it can look unruly. For those of you that like nice, neat, trim borders uh, or patches, uh, no, it's not like that. It will, it will look a little bit of wild, all, a little bit wild all the time, but it is lovely. And uh, the deer sort of um, um, not really love it all that much. I have seen them eat some, but they don't strip it. So that's that's another good reason if you have deer around your house. Okay, now this is um, this is one what I would con uh, consider a very good ground cover. Not necessarily to walk on, but if you want an area under trees with that that shows some significant planting, consider Solomon's seal. This is the variegated kind, and these, by the way, are the these are the little um, flowers. They look like lily of the valley bloom. Um, pollinators find them. It's funny to see some big honeybees trying to get get their thick bodies right into them, but they try anyway. But it's it blooms early. This is what it looks like as as a cover. And so if you want that look, uh, go for this. It, um, it is in full foliage all year round up until the first frost, mm -hmm. then it's over. But up until the first frost, you will have a look like this. So, okay, another um, shade plant is the uh, bleeding heart you're probably familiar with and um, uh, bleeding hearts are in my book a bit finicky they stick around for a while get nice and big and then all of a sudden they disappear but try them and they're nice paired with 
with uh, with phlox so an, a nice pit with um, with the phlox and with the wood poppy. And behind here, what you can see here. Now I almost told you this about ginger, but it's not something else. Sorry. Okay. Another ground cover uh, is barren wood or epimedium. This one grows grew around a uh, the the trunk of a very majestic oak tree, which we just had to cut down. And uh, uh, I thought, oh my goodness, what will happen to the beautiful epimedium? Well, you know, it came back, even though there was a lot of damage in the uh, uh, surrounding area. Sorry, I get carried away here. So the leaves are, um, if you look closely, I'll go to the next slide. They're a bit heart shaped. Uh, the flowers are dainty, but beautiful. They come in white, in kind of a creamy white, in kind of a light yellow, and uh, also in, in red and in a burgundy color. So come in different shades. And when they first arrive, the leaves have this beautiful, beautiful coloring. They will be all green, but then in autumn, they will shade again to a beautiful color. In my book, one of one of the better shade area plants where you want coverage. And again, I would not use that. Uh, it doesn't mind being stepped on once in a while, but not for a heavy traffic area, okay? This one doesn't mind at all being stepped on. This is sweet woodrow or gallium. Gallium odoratum. The reason why it's called odoratum because it has a very lovely scent. It has a lot of fabulous qualities. Among others, that it's it part of it is edible, and the uh, flowers and the uh, leaves can be used uh, uh, in a in a punch. The Europeans have a May punch, and we call it my bowl. So it's a pretty it's a pretty ground cover. And um, it needs some, it's not a very, very fast grower, I have to say to that, but it will gradually spread. And another bit of warning, the when these come up here, they have a, uh, they are a bit of a lookalike to a, a really nasty little invader called sticky weeds. I don't know the Latin name to it, but it's that plant that kind of leaps and crawls along the bottom, looks a bit like this, and it sticks on everything, on your clothes and whatever. So don't confuse the two. Uh, Sweet Woodruff doesn't have that property. It's a very beautiful plant. Now here is a deep, 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 deep shade ground cover uh, or filler in of all kinds of uh, shaded area. That's the wild ginger foliage or a sarum canadense. And that's a beautiful plant. Um, uh, you, will have it, you will have it all year until the end of the year when, when there's frost. So it's, it's a very nice plant and it, it is connected uh, through rhizomes at the bottom, and um, and it once established, it will grow fast, but it takes a little while. It also has a flower which you really don't see unless uh, you lift up the leaves and it's hidden underneath. And uh, this plant, uh, it's very pretty. Look at this, and uh, the colors are look a little bit like the like the blooms of the flower of a papa tree. But uh, it, uh, what I wanted to tell you is this one is uh, uh, pollinated by ants. So a Sarum canadense wild ginger is, if in my book, a must-have too. Okay, now we'll um, show a little bit of, of ferns. And there, there are a lot of ferns. I have some here that are native and some are non-native. Um, Ferns like it moist and they like shade. This is a holly fern. Um, 
looks like a little bit like a like a, a holly tree. It's it's a very striking foliage. This is a native. Uh, most of it here is native. Uh, uh, these are ostrich fern. This is in woodland. I'm. We are, we've been trying to establish the fern grove, and it's uh, it's there is literally very little light here in this area and barely any moisture if we don't have if we don't have any rain there it's very very dry here because it's it's under mature trees and the trees of course are uh, the great users of any kind of moisture that is in the ground so that's 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 the ostrich fern uh, another pretty native is the maidenhair fern. And then this is a non-native, but striking in color. It's sort of gray with a tinge of burgundy. It's a Japanese painted fern. So you can mix ferns if this is what you like. And you can mix ferns with, uh, with hostas too. This is part of woodlands again. Uh, I have a holly fern here and I have our um, hellebore. And you can see there are some, uh, these are nice pairings, nice, nice companions. So you can, you can mix and match even in a natural setting here. So these are some, uh, some other ones. They're sort of on the side. Um, they, they are not native. This is, uh, these are, though they are native arums, but this one isn't. This is arum metallicum. Uh, it's the arum lily. Uh, it has a striking lime green, almost white, not quite white, uh, flower. And when it uh, sets seeds, it's bright orange. So I like them. Some people say they're, they're, they are invasive. Well, not where we have them at all. They are not invasive. If you don't have moisture, they'll they'll go. They don't like it. They like moisture too. Okay, back to my area for for shade plants. If you've ever considered growing these, you can. They don't like bright sun. Uh, they like semi shade. These are, these are fox gloves. Gloves. They are biennials, and um, so you have them one year. Uh, you have a crown one year, next year you have blooms, crown one year, next year you have blooms. However, they only are around for a number of years, and then you may have to start from the beginning. But for a while, for at least five, six years, I had this glorious look for, for a while. Uh, another shade loving plant and a nice plant to have in a um, if you want to if you have a border are uh, the toad lilies they are not native this is uh, the I have two kinds here one a hairy toad lily and and another one they are very late bloomers so if you want diversity and some blooms this is almost like an orchid looking very late in the year. Late September, October is when, after all this foliage has been around over the summer, all of a sudden, uh, these spikes of bloom will appear. Some of them will have spikes, other will bloom directly on, on the plant, like here, and others have a spike coming up. I, I like it a lot. This is uh, another interesting foliage, uh, one of our more toxic plants, though. If you read up on some of the plants that we have commonly around, many of them are toxic. But I would advise if you have, if you have um, um, cats and dogs that are outside, I would probably not have this plant. This is monkshood or um, Wolfsbane, and uh, every bit of the plant is highly toxic. It needs quite a bit of moisture, and if it didn't get enough throughout the year, you won't see blooms. But it blooms like in October when everything is gone, all of a sudden this will come up. And it starts out with little, let me see if I can find it, with little white 
tips and then you know, ah, there will be a bloom. So they form into white little hoods and then the hoods turn like the hood of a monk, turn this incredible bloom. Just wonderful plant. Um, not native to us, of course, but nice shade plant. Okay, hostas, uh, lots of hostas, and I will, there are literally thousands of them you can find in this area. There, none of them is native. These are not plants you want to have in an open woodland environment because the deer will, if you have deer, will have a field day. If it's in your house and it's in a controlled environment um, or in your garden with a fence or in a fenced in area, hostas are fine. Otherwise, uh, you won't have hostas. I can tell you that. Uh, deer just love them. This is a controlled environment. Obviously, no, uh, no deer, but hostas are a pretty landscaping plant. Okay. So don't don't eschew them. Hostas are great plants. They do like they do like moistures and they do like rain. And I even like when when the hostas bloom. Uh, I like the blooms so very much. So I have this is this is all I have. I could talk on probably an, I could talk probably another hour about shade plants, but I can't. Some recommended literature if you're planning on planting and are looking for natives. Here's a very nice uh, um, little book. It's called Native Plants for Northern Virginia. Um, and I put a link on here, uh, Plant Nova Natives. It's available online. You can download it for free. Otherwise, it's just a few dollars for, uh, for a copy. And it has everything in there. I have to give it a big plug. It has the native plants in our area by, uh, by type of plant, by tree, by shrub, by, by uh, ground cover, and when they are blooming, how tall they get, and so forth. Um, light conditions, all of that. It's great. Uh, these are some of my personal books that I have, one fabulous one in terms of looking for ideas to plant shade gardens is this Ken Druze, who, by the way, is a uh, uh, garden architect par excellence, and he's famous in the United States. Uh, he brought a book out. It's, it's already a few, uh, few decades old, but it's still worthwhile. And you may find it at your library. It's called The Natural Shade Garden. And uh, now he addresses shade gardens throughout the United States in that, OK? And then uh, another practical one, a smaller little book, is Easy Care Shade Flowers by Patricia Taylor. Both of them are are older, but very, very worthwhile. Harriet, there's one question in the chat. Um, Sally says, I normally think of shaded areas as being under trees, but when planting a bed that has a northwest exposure versus shade caused by trees, does the design approach need to be different? Yeah, with, uh, with northwest, uh, west, if it were just north, uh, if, if it were just west, you would be ideal because you have some light during the day and then you have uh, um, you have ideal, you have some shade, but you have plenty of light for your plants. If it's northwest, um, I would go with um, with I would go with uh, with hostas with some of the deep shade plants that uh, uh, that I mentioned, um, some of the uh, shrubs, heucharis will do fine in that area. Um, and they, they come in different colors. Next question is, do you have experience with viburnum? Does it do well in shade? Yeah, I have, um, I, I have one, I don't have viburnum in, um, in, in the woodlands. I, however, I have a viburnum and I don't know the kind. It's blooming right now. It's very pretty. It didn't like the frost though. So it was a little frostbitten. And it shows that the uh, 
uh, uh, the tips of the leaves are brown, so that that was frostbite. Um, it it does fine. It's under trees, along a fence, under trees, and it does well. Okay, next question. I have a huge holly tree that has kept all the plantings from growing. What would be a plant good? What would be a good plant that isn't a moisture-loving one that would survive underneath it? Oh dear, uh, that's hard. Um, that is that is hard. Uh, we uh, we have two American hollies in our yard. I have very little, very little uh, underneath there. Uh, you could try. Well, the problem, it's, the problem is not a problem. It's a challenge. It's twofold. You have, you, um, the holly needs, needs acidic soil. You could under, under. Next to it, you could plant rhododendron. You wouldn't mind that. And you get some color. Um, probably ginger may not like it. I'm just trying to think what we have. There isn't a whole lot, if they're big, that you can plant there. You could try, now here we go. You could try, you could try uh, plant some hellebore and see how that works. Okay. That's about it for questions. That's it? Okay. How did I do time-wise? We're right at 12 o'clock. We're right in twelve. Okay, I just I just do want to do want to stress um, uh, one thing, and um, I didn't point that out at the very beginning. Many of the plants in woodlands are, and I didn't mention that, uh, are deer not deer friendly at all, and they are deer resistant, not necessarily deer proof, because I've seen deer eat some really unusual things that they normally don't touch. They don't touch anything fuzzy. They don't, they don't like ferns. They do not like any of the spring bloomers. They just don't like them. Um, but uh, the ones I mentioned are left alone by deer. Okay. So other than um, the hostas is the one that I wouldn't have out. And they will, they will eat. Uh, I've seen if you have Cone flowers nearby, they will eat those. I just want to, uh, wanted to bring that up. So, um, but on the whole, for shade loving plants, um, you know, consider going uh, or planting or adding to, to your mix of what you already have, some native plants. It's good for the environment and uh, it's, it's good for the pollinate, uh, pollinators. It attracts a lot of insects, which in turn will feed the birds. And uh, 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 many of them, especially the native ones to our area, are host plants to a wide varieties of, of butterflies and others and moth. Okay. All right. I thank you, everyone, for your attention. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you next week. Enjoy your week. If you're interested in lawn care, please contact our Best Lawns Coordinator, Natalie Walker, at nwalker at pwcgov.org.